Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> what a joy it is to be in Paris, Texas. Be honest with you, what a joy it is to be anywhere right now for me. <clears throat> I've been through some hard times and been through some good times, but the last two or three weeks has been sort of hard times. But what a joy it is to be here and, and recognize the people who are the recipients of these particular awards. And uh, I've said this a jillion times. I love Paris, Texas. I love everything about Paris. I grew up in Paris. <laughs> Married my sweet wife, Ruth Ann. She went to Paris. And, and uh, when I retired, I wanted to live back in Paris, Texas. So it took us 40 years to buy a piece of property so that when I did retire, we could come back to Paris, Texas. What a joy it is to be here tonight and, and say a few words about some of the people and some of the things that we've been talking about. My complaining days are over. <clears throat> My little boy, John Mark, born with Down syndrome. I could tell something was wrong with him. Those of us that have children, we can tell when something is not right. Something wasn't right with Johnny. He was having a hard time breathing. I have got a monitor. I'm sitting beside him. I could tell that he was having a hard time, and I get in bed with him. He's just having a hard time breathing. I check his oxygen saturation. I don't know if you know anything about oxygen saturation or not, but when you go to the hospital, they put that little thing on your finger. They're checking your oxygen saturation. Everybody in here is in the 90s. If you're not in the 90s, you're ready for ICU. I checked Johnny. He was 62. I said, Johnny, how do you feel? He said, I fine. I fine. If anybody had an opportunity to complain just a little bit, you know, when you can't breathe, nothing counts. I said, Johnny, how do you feel? He said, I fine. Passed away the next morning. My life wouldn't be nearly as rich if it wasn't for the fact that Ruth Ann and I raised a child that had special needs and John Mark and, and what a joy it was to, to see and raise and be associated with Johnny. <clears throat> Johnny has been affiliated with lots of people. Lots of stories about Johnny. One of my favorite stories about Johnny and Bob's Coach Landry. And I was coaching professional football in professional football, you bring your children to practice on Saturday. I want to bring Johnny. I want him to meet Coach Landry. We practice on this over and over and over. I said, John, we're going to go to the coach's dressing room. I'm going to say, Coach Landry, I'd like for you to meet my son, Johnny. Johnny, I'd like for you to meet Coach Landry. And you will say, glad to meet you, Coach Landry. We went over it, I know, a hundred times. <laughs> We had it down, brother. We go in the coach's dressing room and there's Coach Landry and I got him by the hand and got Johnny and I said, Coach Landry, I'd like for you to meet my son, Johnny. Johnny, I'd like for you to meet Coach Landry. And Johnny said, hi, Tom. <laughs> Never called him anything but Tom. The rest of us called him Coach Landry all the time. But Johnny always referred to him it's Tom. <clears throat> Lots of awards have been awarded, Johnny. Not, not too long ago, Faulkner University, a major university in the state of Alabama, named their football playing field, the John Mark Stallings playing field. Now, I'm in six Hall of Fames, and I don't have a football field named after me. <laughs> Johnny has a football field named, named after him. And it just goes on and on and on. So as I've said on many occasions, my life wouldn't have been nearly as rich if it wasn't for the fact that Ruth Ann and I had the privilege of raising a child with Down syndrome. <clears throat> you know, in, in this day and time, we're talking about leadership and things of that nature. 
thinking right becomes awfully important. Somewhere along the line, we've got to think right. If you're going to be successful in whatever you're doing, you've got to think right. I'm having dinner with Stan Musial, the great Stan Musial. The only two people at the table is, is Stan Musial and myself, and he's coaching the St. Louis Cardinals, and I can't believe that I'm having – Dinner was Stan Musial, and I keep punching myself, and I said, it's Stan Musial. I said, I know it. I... <laughs> it wasn't long before we got talking about baseball. And he leans over the table, and he got a little age on him, and he pulls that bat back, and he's looking at the pitcher, and he said, Coach, that ball hadn't gone that far. I knew what it was. It's a fastball, slider, sinker. He said, I couldn't wait to hit it. And then this is what he said. You know what I loved about playing big league baseball for the St. Louis Cardinals? I said, no, what's that, Mr. Musial? He said, I wanted to be the bottom of the ninth, behind one run, two outs, runner on second, runner on third. I wanted to hear the announcer say, stand Musial to the plate. See, that's thinking right. Most of us want somebody else to go to plate. If you hit it, a little short ball, a strike out, a, we, somebody's going to pat you on the shoulder and say, no big deal. Stan Musial said he wanted to hear the announcer say, Stan Musial to the plate. I'm telling you, that is thinking right. Somewhere along the line, if you're going to be successful, You've got to learn how to think right. I'm playing golf with the great Ben Hogan. We're playing on Shady Oaks Country Club, Fort Worth, Texas. Both of us are playing fairly well. Mr. Hogan's driving a cart. I'm trying to make a little conversation. I said, Mr. Hogan, let me ask you a question. He said, okay. Driving down the 18th fairway. <clears throat> I said, you've already hit your ball. You're stepping back and you're watching your opponent hit his. What goes through your mind? You want to see him hit it bad? See, if I'm playing Josh Bray and he hits it bad, it's going to tickle me just a little bit. I, I'm not going to make a big deal about it, but it's going to tickle me because I know I can make a five and still beat the man. And I just want to hear what Mr. Hogan said. He slammed on that break. I could shut my eyes and I could still feel the sensation of that cart rocking back and forth. And he wheeled around and looked at me and he said, boy, let me tell you something. If I ever win a golf match, I want it to be because I play good, not because you play bad. He said, do you understand that? I said, yes, sir. I understand that. See, that's thinking right. We've got to be in, in a position to teach ourselves how to think right. We, most of the people then in position of authority, they know how to deal with people. There's a big difference in dealing with things and dealing with people. Nobody dealt with people better than Coach Bryant. He just could deal with people. An, an example or two. I just graduated from Texas A&M. I joined Coach Bryant's staff at Alabama. First game we played against Vanderbilt. Score was tied six and six. Game was over. He told the players, he said, I want you to be in the hotel, in your room at 12 o'clock. I had played for Coach Bryant. I knew that he meant just exactly what he said. I'm at, in Printer's Alley with some riders, we go into a joint or two, and there's about 12 or 15 players. I can't believe that. I just, I, they're jumping off the fire escape and running. I just can't believe what I'm seeing. I knew that if I told Coach Bryant, he'd fire him, wouldn't even take him back to Tuscaloosa, and we had to have some players, so I decided I'd handle it. So Sunday after practice, I said, all you guys that I'm looking at, I didn't have a clue who they were. 
I said, all you guys that I'm looking for, you come over here, if we, we need to visit a few minutes. 12, 15 of them left. So I told them a little bit about Coach Bryant. And I decided that I was not going to kill them, but I was going to come this close to kill them. <laughs> I was going to run them till they nearly died. We had one player on our team named Carl Hobson, had All-American written all over him. He about 6'2", 215, 220, ran a legitimate 9'8", sophomore. I mean, he was the real deal. He was one of these 12 or 15 that was there, and I was running them, running them, running them. I'm just fixing to quit, just fixing to send them in. And Carl Hobson said, I quit. I said, Carl, if you walk off this field, you're through. He said, I'm telling you now, I'm through. All the other players ran up to me and said, what are you going to tell Coach Bryant when he's going to ask who the rest of them were? I said, I don't know. <laughs> I think of something because all this time I'm thinking Carl Hobson is going to call and apologize. I stayed up all night by the telephone. Carl Hobson didn't come and apologize. I got to go in Coach Bryant's office. If anybody's going to fire Carl Hobson, it's going to be Coach Bryant, not going to be an assistant coach that's making $2,200 a year. So I, I said, Coach, there's something i got to tell you. So I told him what happened. And I said, I tried to handle it, and I was going to run him. And Carl Hobson quit. You could have heard him over a 20-mile area. He said, Carl Hobson, quit. I'm just standing right there. <laughs> he said, Carl Hobson, quit. I said, yes, sir. He said, who's the rest of them? I said, Coach, I can't tell you. He said, yeah. <laughs> hey, you, you work for me, don't you? And I said, yes, sir. But if you want me to help you coach this football team, I can't tell you. He thought there a minute, looked at me, and he said, okay. Till the day he died, I'm a head coach in the pros. We talk over the phone from time to time. From the time he, he never one time said, babes, remember Nashville? Remember those guys? Who were the rest of them? A great lesson in that in the leadership, man, is let bygones be bygones. If you're going to be in charge of something and you're going to deal with somebody and you're going to talk about it, you got to learn to let a bygone be a bygone. See, those are leadership qualities. You've got to learn to let a bygone be a bygone. When you discuss it and you talk about it, you don't bring it up anymore. Another great example of Coach Bryant's leadership. I'd violated a rule, not a, not a big rule, but <clears throat> high school coach, assistant coach was sick. He said, you help me coach this afternoon? I said, D. Joe, I'm a college coach. I can't help you. And he said, you want Lynn Fowler, don't you? I said, yeah, I got to help Lynn. I got to have Lynn Fowler. He said, if you help me coach this afternoon, I guarantee you, you will get Lynn Fowler. He was the best player in Alabama. All, all this time, I'm taking my gear off, putting gear on, knowing I shouldn't do it. Felt a little bit bad about it. I told Sam Bailey, I said, Sam, I think I screwed up. I think I violated one of the rules. And I told him one day, he said, Beep, you didn't do that, did you? I said, yeah. He said, don't tell anybody. I said, I'll assure you I won't tell anybody. They were at a conference meeting. Orlando, Florida. Shook Jordan, coaching at Auburn. Looked at Coach Bryant and said, Paul, do you have any problems? If I send my coaches out in the spring of the year, coach these high schools. Coach Bryant said, Shook, you can't do that. It's against the rules. He said, you got somebody on your staff that's doing it. Coach Bryant said, nobody on my staff's that stupid. <laughs> he said, well, I'll just call Sam Bailey. He'll tell me. So he called Sam, and then all the coaches sitting around laughing at him. And he said, Sam, one of the coaches told me that 
One of my coaches, coach in high school, was in his truth of that. He said, yes, sir, one of them, one of them did. Click, hung up. All the coaches and athletic directors laughing at Coach Bryant. Carney Lashley, the older coach, was there. He said, Paul's mad at you. Paul's mad at you, Lord. Paul's mad at you. Coach Bryant called a staff meeting. And I knew the staff meeting was for me. I sat with my back to him. Coach Bryant could take longer to light a cigarette. He couldn't find it, couldn't find a match. He'd pull out this drawer. Pull, and all this time I'm sweating knowing that the meeting is for me. Finally, I can tell him, see him taking a drag of that old Chesterfield cigarette and leans back and takes a puff out of it. And I said, here it comes. Here it comes. We started talking about fishing. There a place in Alabama where you could, you could fish. And we talked about fishing till around 12, around 10.30 that afternoon. I couldn't hardly, and finally it was a long pause, and I said, here it comes, here it comes. Started talking about turkey hunting. <laughs> Every place in Alabama where you can go turkey hunting. Two o'clock in the afternoon, still talking about turkey hunting. I can't hardly set up my chair. I mean, he has bled me to death, man. I, Finally, there was a long pause. I said, here it comes. Here it comes. Finally, he looked at the staff, and he said, that's all. And I grabbed my books and started off, and he said, no, babes, I want to see you. So he goes back, and he relays the story to me. He said, did you do that? I said, yes, sir, I did. Why in the world would you do that? I said, Coach, you need good football players. I was just trying to get you a good football player. And I just fouled up. He thought there a minute, and he said, don't ever do that again. I said, Coach, I won't. The moral of that story is everybody likes to be praised in public. You like to be criticized in private. Somewhere along the line, you've got to learn how to deal with people in private. If you want to do something and brag on them, you brag on them. That's leadership, man. That's getting the most out of your people. That's getting them to perform at a high level. It's, I understand there's no substitute for knowledge. I understand if I've said this one time, I've said it a thousand times, education is the key. We go to college for an education, not to play football, baseball, basketball. We go to college for an education. Education is the key. We need to get that education. We need to do the very best we can with it. Sometimes we're along the line. It's dealing with people that makes a difference. Coach Brown was an expert at dealing with people. Those of us that have been successful somewhere along the line, we've had to deal with people. All of my coaching career, I've always made the decision what I felt like was in the best interest of the player, not in the best interest of the team, the best interest of the player. There's a difference. I'm coaching Texas A&M. We lost four in a row. I had a great player on my football team. He liked to do two things. He liked shoot poo and play football. Morris Mormon, all he cared about. He didn't care a hoot about going to class. I called him in my office. I said, Morris, you listen to what I'm telling you. You cut one more class, and you played your last down for Texas A&M. We lost four in a row. Getting ready to play Texas Tech. I get a telephone call from a professor. Maurice Mormon cut my class today. Now you just put yourself in that situation. You're 0-4. You've got an All-American offensive tackle that's by far the best player in the country. And you've already said that if he cuts one more class, you're going to release him. I call him in my office. Both of us cried. He said, Coach, I didn't think you'd do that. I said, Maurice, I didn't think you'd cut that class either. 
Number one draft choice for Kansas City. Played for nine or ten years. Saved his money. I get a telephone call from Morris Mormon. Coach, I need to come see you. I didn't know whether he was going to slap me, <laughs> shoot me, hit me. I didn't have a clue. I said, Morris, come on. He said, I live in Louisville, Kentucky. I'm going to drive to Paris, Texas, and visit with you on your ranch. He drove down. We had made a little small talk. Basically, the conversation went like this. Morris, you're the only person that I've ever, that's ever coached me that's ever been honest with me. I always people would say, if you do this, I'm going to do that. If you do this, I'm going to do that. He said, you did it. That made a difference in my life. He said, I've saved my money. I've been successful. I'm turning my business over to my children. And the reason is because you were honest with me and nobody else were. You've got to do what you think is in the best interest of your player if you're a coach. You've got to do in the best interest of the player. You've got to teach that player to think right. He's got to be associated with good people. <clears throat> He's got to do the best he can under all the situations. We're talking about heroes. There's no greater hero in this area than Raymond Berry. I went to high school with Raymond. He was big and his feet were so big we called him skis. He looked like his own skis. He ran a 100-yard dash and about 12 flat. Skis could catch a football. That's one thing he could do. He could catch the football. He gets a scholarship to Shriner Institute. That's a junior college. We all said the reason Skis got that scholarship because his daddy was a coach. He goes to Shriner, gets half scholarship to SMU. What he does in the, in the fall, the spring of the year, goes out for track. Hey, Skis, who are you going to beat today? Didn't ever beat anybody. But he got to speed down a little bit better, speed down a little bit better. I'm not too sure he ever started the game at SMU. Baltimore coach took him in the 23rd round. When Raymond Berry retired from the Baltimore Colts, he had caught more passes than anybody in the history of the National Football League. More passes than anybody in the history of the league. Did it just happen? No, it didn't just happen. He got better and better and better and better and better. His work ethic was above reproach, and now when he retires, he had caught more passes than anybody in the history of the National Football League. That tells me that anybody can be good if they want to badly enough. Not enough people want to be bad, good badly enough to pay the price. Raymond paid the price and wrote a book. All the new, all the moves that I have, I read it not too long ago, and it's talking about his work ethic. See, a work ethic is just second to none. I just, I wouldn't hire anybody that I didn't feel like had a good work ethic. It's just something about a work ethic. You do as you like with your children. I've got four daughters. In order to marry my daughters, son-in-laws had to work for me. Had to work for me on my ranch. I'd get them up for daylight. Wouldn't even let them think about quitting until after dark. <laughs> Girls would say, Daddy, what do you think? I said, I think you need to cull him. <laughs> Cut him loose. Daddy, he's a nice boy. I know he's a nice boy, but he hadn't got a work ethic. I've got a son-in-law that's a Ph.D. One's an M.D. One's an attorney. One's a football coach. But they all have one thing in common. They can all build a fence. <laughs> See, it's just something about a work ethic. There's nothing wrong with golf. I, I grew up as a caddy, and I, I enjoyed golf. I'm going to hire a guy one time. I've already made up my mind I was going to hire him. And in the course of the conversation, he's leaving. He said, Coach, I just want to tell you that I love golf. I said, Son, I grew up as a caddy. I enjoy playing golf. I said, What's your handicap? He said, my handicap is scratch. I said, let me tell you what to do. 
You go get in your car and go down the highway and try to get a job somewhere else. <laughs> he said, you're not going to hire me because I'm a good golfer? I said, that's exactly right. I know how much time it takes to be a good husband, to be a good daddy, be a good football coach. I know how much time it takes to be a good golfer. Golf ain't giving in your Something else is giving. Golf's not giving. There's nothing wrong with playing golf. I enjoy golf, but I'm not interested in hiring somebody that's a scratch golfer. I'm hiring somebody to do a job. See, somewhere along the line, we, we've got to have an appreciation of what we're doing. I've got a daughter that lives in the country of Haiti. Your wildest imagination. You can't believe how poor the people are in the country of Haiti. A town of 170,000 has no electricity, has no sewage, has no fresh water, has no nothing. Why in the world would my daughter and her husband move to the country of Haiti to feed the poor and take care of the people in need? Why would they do that? It's the right thing to do. I'm not a Phi Beta Kappa, but I know somewhere along the line we got to do the right thing strictly because it's the right thing to do. And those people that won the awards here tonight, somewhere along the line, they did the right thing strictly because it's the right thing to do. I've coached all my life, but I never coached for the money. I left a lot of money on the table, I realize that. It's a job that I was interested in, not the money. I never coached for the money. I was coaching pro ball, college ball, work. I never knew what I made until I got my first check. See, somewhere along the line, something has got to count for us. In closing, got a letter not too terribly long ago from this lady. Had a severely handicapped child, both mentally and physically. She's writing a letter about the joys of raising this child and then she's talking about the struggles of raising this child. This is the way she closed her letter. Life is not about waiting until the storm passes by. It's learning how to dance in the rain. Learning how to dance in the rain. See, Johnny taught me how to dance in the rain. It's just something about doing the best you can with what you've got. Never giving up. And in closing, I love the poem, The Dash. I read where a man stood to speak at a funeral of a friend. Made mention of the tombstone, the dates from the beginning to the end. At first, he mentioned the date of the birth. The latter, he mentioned with tears. Said, what matters most of all is that dash between the years because it represents all the time that he was alive upon this earth, and only those who knew him best knew what that dash was worth. Matters not how much you own, your house, your cars, your cash. What matters most of all is the way you live that dash. If you could just slow down a bit and see what's true and real, try to understand how the other fellow feels. More often, wear a smile. There's a little dash. They only last a while. And as your eulogy is being read and your life is being rehashed, are you going to be proud to hear the people say the way you live your dash? See, we do the right thing strictly because it's the right thing to do. Taking care of our family, taking care of our children, taking care of our grandchildren, teaching them how to do right. That's the right thing to do. You people that are recipients of these awards, my highest congratulations goes out to you. To Josh, who's going to be your new president. And it's a, it's a thankless job. Those of us that have been affiliated with jobs that, that are, are just sort of given to you and, and you don't get any pay for it or anything, and, Nine people out of ten going to complain about something. But if we have a great appreciation for people such as Josh who will take on the responsibility of 
making our community a better place to live. I've said this a jillion times. I love Paris, Texas. I can't think of a better place to grow up. High schools and the elementary schools and the athletic programs and the bands and the worst thing that could happen to a youngster when I was in high school was go by to see Mr. Cunningham, the president, <laughs> principal. If you went by to see him, you were in big trouble. Oh, they do things now we didn't even think about. But we got to learn to adjust. Teach our children to do right. Teach them to be proud of what they do and make a difference in the community. So congratulations on you recipients and thank you for letting me be a little part of your program. Thank you.